Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. Okay, so on the show today, Gavriel Strauss. So Gavriel is a specialist in Jewish mysticism. Um, spiritual counselor and relationship coach. So I've, I've got a personal interest in this subject for slightly strange reasons. It just seems to keep coming back to me, the Jewish tradition through various teachers and experiences, despite being in, in no way Jewish. So um, I'm very much looking forward to chatting today. So welcome. Thanks so much, Mark. And I got it right, Gavriel. That's right. Boom. Okay, those vowels are important. So how did you get interested in the body let's go in through this gateway sure you know uh so i was raised uh, in a very traditional orthodox home and uh orthodox community and um i would say body was the one of the last uh priorities uh in, in this in this tradition but more so the head was the the main focal point mm-hmm. um so we'll get into that more, but essentially that, that left me disembodied. And so when I got to college, um, the stress of figuring out what the hell I'm doing with my life uh, kind of pushed me up into my head to try and figure it out. And I, and I was feeling really overwhelmed. Um, and I decided to try this free yoga class at uh, you know in the the basement of my uh, of my of my art school um, back when yoga wasn't uh, wasn't the, all the rage and uh, it was phenomenal like as soon as I started you know getting into my body doing the postures I felt the energy just drop down from my head and I felt like so much more grounded it was, it was phenomenal shift in me and that that was when i was hooked and you know what i feel like myself and most of the listeners listening to this may have even almost forgotten what that's like like most of the people listening to this have had a body practice for like 10 maybe 20 years or they've grown up with yoga some of the kids you know and it's um to come from a extremely cognitive cultural background which i would say is all of the western world and perhaps, you know, and I'd love to hear your take on this, perhaps more so Jewish tradition or certain Jewish traditions. And then to hit a yoga class or a martial arts class and be like, oh my God, my body's a thing, or it's not a thing. The, the, you know, it's part of the subject, the opposite of the thing. Like, wow, that's quite a phenomenal kind of wake up call. If you, and that you're, as you tell me, yeah. also, I'm hearing, you know, re- recall, remembering back my first sort of martial arts experiences or sexual experiences at 16, 18 and going, what a bomb that was. What a wake up call. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's like coming home. It's like a coming home that takes place and remembering like, oh yeah, I, I have a body. I'm an animal. Like, and it feels really good to be here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Remembering. That sounds very visceral. If you actually break that word down, I've never thought of it quite that way. That's right. Remembering. Remembering. Yeah. Yeah. Remembering our different members, our different parts of our bodies. Yeah. Putting them back together. And that is remembering is one definition of sati, the word that's normally translated as mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition to come back home to. Okay. So I want to hear more about you then. So, the, you're from this Orthodox Jewish family, yeah. And what, first of all, like, what does that mean in terms of bodily terms? Like, many of us may be in New York or in North London, or you know, we have listeners in Israel, of course, but many parts of the world, Russia, will have seen people going around and go, okay, they're dressed a certain way. Those guys must be Orthodox Jews. But what does that actually mean, like experientially, particularly from a body? Point? <sighs> It's so intense. <laughs> it's, it, it, it means like from the moment you open your eyes in the morning to the moment you close your eyes at night, you have a system for every step you take. There's, there's a system directing and guiding every movement you make. Um, from the moment you open your eyes, you say a, a, a prayer, you know, thanking God for the new day. 
and then you're going throughout your day and every step is is like is planned it's like mm-hmm. orchestrated structure there so there's real whole, structure in that tradition yeah super intense structure um which doesn't leave a lot of room for creativity doesn't leave a lot of room for going outside the box for exploring your body <laughs> um for even uh, considering that the body might be a, a, an important um, thing to be in tune with. It, it, it it's, gets you in a real rigidity um, of how to move through life in a body. And I've heard, we've had various um, Jewish people on the show, Paul Linder, my own teacher, Jamie Zimron was, did an episode. Um, the, the, the Jews are definitely overrepresented in um uh any intellectual pursuits i mean look at the number of prizes the jews won as a percentage of the world population is absurdly different from you know the percentage of nobel prizes they've won and it, even in embodiment fields which is something kind of jewish ethnicity is not particularly known for like athletics for example isn't if you watch say the american athletic team you wouldn't necessarily see, you know, overrepresentation of Jewish people. <laughs> like that's a stereotype, right? But it's based, you know, it's based on something. Whereas you would sound like African American people, right? Uh, you know, you you do definitely see like more Afro Caribbeans and so British mm-hmm. Olympics. Like, mm-hmm. Maybe biological reasons for that, or whatever. But there's this overrepresentation, even in embodiment. And some of those teachers have been on and they've said the Jewish tradition is actually more embodied than some of the other major, major religious traditions. Like I've seen the Orthodox Jews dancing at the airport in Tel Aviv and this thing about like, it's a mitzvah to shag your wife on this, on the Sabbath. Yeah. Like there are a few kind of bodily type things in that tradition. Would you say there's an argument for that? Or would you say the opposite, that it's more of a okay. common tradition? Yeah. So we need to, we need to unpack that for sure. So, so the, you know, what came to mind to me too, is like, um, there, <laughs> The traditional folks, you're going to see them in the prayer hall, in the, in the yeshiva. Yeshiva means sitting. <laughs> it means to sit. You, uh-huh. you, you, you sit in the prayer hall all day studying Talmud. You get your head in the book. We be, we've become the people of the book. Right. So that means we're in the yeshiva, we're sitting there with the Talmud open, we're studying um, all day long. Mm-hmm. And so that's a very that's a very cognitive that's very disembodied. It's not paying attention to the body at all. Um, but the 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 roots of the tradition, I would say, the core of it, yes, there's there's there is a deep deep embodiment connection there. And I think the reason why you see so many um, Jewish people in nowadays, kind of like in progressive. Uh, areas of uh, Western, uh, sorry, Eastern philosophy of yoga, Buddhism, yeah. embodiment. They're called the Jubus, apparently. Yeah. Jewish Buddhists. Yeah. And again, overrepresented. Why do you think that is? Because they're coming, because they're coming back to their roots. Because actually there's, there's a pathway of embodiment, of deeper connection that is in the core of the tradition, but has been lost. It's yeah. been forgotten. And the reasons it's been forgotten is, you know, there's a, there's a lot to say there. Um, but it, it's mostly around survival, around fear of survival, and a, and a really old narrative that we have that, you know, we just had Passover. And on and, and that Passover Seder, we read, like, you know, every, the, throughout every generation, there's someone who hates us, who's trying to kill us. Who's and that's the message that gets kind of put in. As, yeah, one of my fav- one of my friends in Israel says every Jewish cel- uh, holiday is basically they tried to kill us, they didn't. Let's eat, right. and while the let's eat part may be very physical and celebratory, there's also a message being you know said there, isn't there? Like like the world is dangerous, you, you know, other people can't be trusted, and there's there's a certain implicit embodied message there of the dangerousness of the world, and I I don't know anything that would reinforce that more than having the end of your penis cut off either you know, a few days old. So like, like that, you know, on an unconscious level, that seems to be very much reinforcing that sense of the dangerousness of the world. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that I would say that kind of narrative, you know, keeps us, has, has, has made us forget the core or the heart or the body of our tradition, which is very, very embodied. Um, from my perspective, what, how I've seen it is that 
you know, Judaism demands us to be in our bodies and not just to be in our bodies, to, to extract a very deep pleasure from being in our bodies. Like you said, there's a, you know, there's the, the, the commandment to you know, shag your wife on Shabbat. That that's a loose translation that, of the Talmud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that 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 is a that's see that is the element of Shabbat, which is which is uh, you know it's the perfect topic to discuss embodiment for Judaism because what is Shabbat? Shabbat um, the it's you know, and 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 it's it's the day of rest. Mm -hmm. It's really you could say Shabbat is the day of embodiment. Um, it's the day when we, we, we unplug from our heads in, in screens. We unplug from our heads in trying to figure shit out, trying to figure out our lives, trying to figure out our work. And, and we rest in being. We drop down and we rest in being. And the body is the, the channel to doing that. So... As soon as Shabbat comes in, we have a, we have a, we have a sacred meal. And we pray, we open the gates, and then we light candles, and we bring in the light, and we have a sacred meal. And we begin that sacred meal with wine, with an, with an intoxicant to lubricate the system, to get it to chill out. And then, like, we eat. Like, yep. we, you know, we get into the pleasure of eating. And, like, that's what the whole... 25 hours of Shabbat is, is, is about. It's about being in the body, relaxing, chilling out. It, and, and it's funny, you know, the, the, the Ashkenaz uh, tradition calls it Shabbos. Mm -hmm. uh, Shabbat, Shabbos. I call it Shabbos. <laughs> it's, 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 it's about accessing spiritual embodied bliss. Yeah, yeah and what a sort of needed message you know in a modern world which doesn't rest which doesn't turn off yeah. you know i'm just looking at my own calendar right now and going, god it looks so full what have i done what can i cancel i just canceled something so i have a two-day weekend for the first time in months i canceled something on the saturday i was going to do yeah and i was able to do it with integrity and it was fine i was like oh god you know i've got a weekend like maybe this weekend which you know was in it was in whether it's friday saturday sunday you know whatever combination thereof who cares? Tuesday, Wednesday. Maybe this was invented for a reason. This sense of like respecting cycle and rhythm and rest and pleasure and reconnection. Like, oh, maybe there's some wisdom in some of these. Uh, you know, I mean, growing up as a kid, actually, the shops were closed on a Sunday in England. They yeah. absolutely weren't allowed. Then most of them were closed on a Saturday, and they were definitely closed on a Sunday. All of them. And then I remember the first shop being open, people found it a bit controversial, you know, and this is, I'm not that old. So it's like, we kind of lost that Shabbat tradition, our equivalent of it in you know, Christian or, you know, Christian plus countries. Yes. Yes. We need to rest. We need to unplug, uh, especially in our crazy fast paced culture. We need to unplug. And, and so there's the wisdom and the tradition, which is just like saying like, not, not only should you, but you have to, you must. <laughs> right, so like it, it, I was there for Purim, you have to get drunk, right? Like it is, is it, am I pronouncing it yeah, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just drunk people everywhere. I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> you have to, yeah. it's the law. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's the, it's the law, it's the law. So there's the wisdom in keeping that structure, and, and, but at the same time, then that structure becomes limiting. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't let you come out of that and get creative about that, which is where I find a lot of, you know, a lot of issue. Mm. Um, yeah. It can get rule bound. I mean, if we look at it through that integral developmental lens, you know, I've had other people on the show, like Ken Wilbur and other people talk about the developmental lens, like it could look very orthodox, like literally that word is used, right? But that's yeah. also a word we might use to say orthodox Christianity or an orthodox approach to Iyengar yoga that there's rules, there's a system, there's a hierarchy, there's a kind of set way of doing things which can be disembodying because there's very little room to feel and, as you say, be creative within that. Yeah, absolutely. So that, so that we come, become bound to the tradition rather than allowing it to liberate us. And that's really perfect timing too because we just had Passover and 
I don't know how many people out there you know, listening have been to a Passover Seder, but traditionally the Passover Seder is a really long experience that we just go, it's very dry. You read through this book, it's got, you know, like got to read every single thing. And then like, finally you get to the meal hours later and you're just like, oh my God, this is, you know, my wife is like, the, the Passover is my least favorite holiday. You know, I hate the Seder. But that's because we've become bound to it. We've become slaves to it, which is crazy because mm. Passover is all about celebrating a freedom. Yeah, right. Uh, Getting free. Right? Slavery. Yeah. <laughs> but we become actually slaves mm -hmm. to the tradition instead of accessing the deeper wisdom, which can liberate us, which can bring us to a, a state of liberation, which is really the... Again, it's the core essence of Judaism is, is, a, is, is accessing liberation and embodied liberation. Um, not about, you know, promoting, you know, not, it's not, the, 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 you know, it's, it's not the, 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 the current Jewish narrative, which is just like, you're here to be Jewish. Do the practices of Judaism. That's the point. That's the end. No, the practices are in means to to not just a personal or a um, cultural or religious liberation, but a, a global liberation. Let's let's say some more about that then, because you know Judaism is linked to an ethnicity. This is different from Christianity. Uh, it's different from Islam. You know, most people might think you know Arabs are Islamic or something like that, but actually, you know, there's Arabs who are Christian, and there's the biggest Islamic country is not Arabic. It's in Indonesia, and Buddhists, you know, maybe Thai or Sri Lankan or Japanese. The only religions I really know that are super linked to being ethnicities, to ethnicities are Shintoism in Japan and uh, Judaism. And they're kind of like, that is a significant difference. So it's like, what, I almost put this like to anyone listening to this, why should, you know, John the atheist in London or, you know, Svetlana, the, the Orthodox Christian in Russia be interested in this stuff? Um, because, well, it's interesting, you know, you brought up those, 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 uh, those examples and, and where I'm coming from is that, uh, I feel like Judaism has a relevance to, uh, to everyone. It's been uh, this kind of exclusive club and my sense is really, it's just like, no, just like you don't need to be from Asia to be Buddhist or from India to do yoga, to get the benefits of these spiritual technologies. Um, you, you, you don't need to be Jewish to get benefit from the spiritual technologies of Judaism. Um, Judaism is a spiritual path and practice that is actually designed for the marketplace, for people living in the marketplace, not for people who are living in a monastery. Yeah. But people who are living in homes, who have relationships, who have families, children, jobs, all of it. It's, it's, it's the most grounded and integrated religion in my perspective. It's not it's about... It's a householder path, they'd say, right? It's, it's fully householder path. It's not about tripping out and, and transcending yeah. you know, the regular reality. It's about being in the, the grime of it and finding God there. Mm -hmm. And... The marketplace, you know, there's a, a stereotype there of sort of Jews involved with finances for the his, you know historical reasons in Europe, and it's like I actually like that phrase, the marketplace. There's something about like, okay, if this doesn't apply to money and maybe like family and you know this kind of real kind of stuff of life, I have this sense as well that there's a treasure trove there from the very little I've seen. There's a a treasure trove of um, spiritual knowledge that how can I put this? Like I've got a lot from say Buddhism and the Asian traditions, but because those weren't ethnically linked quite so much, they were much more easily disseminated. And I wonder now if there isn't a sort of potential dissemination and you see the seeds of that with sort of Kabbalah getting trendy or things like that. My intuition is there's a lot there because all the Jewish people I know make some clever shit. And I would be very surprised if their spiritual stuff wasn't as equally clever as stuff that I've seen, you know, other Jewish friends and colleagues develop in other areas, uh, especially given a couple of thousand years, a few thousand years to work on it. Like, I'm sure there's some good shit in there. Yes, absolutely. There's some real, real uh, incredible wisdom and jewels for, for, for everyone, truly. 
And that's the, you know, that's, you know, the, 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 you know, the heart of where I'm coming from is to say, Hey, like, here you go. Like we, you don't need to be, you know, part of the club to get the benefits of, of the tradition. Like, um, come and find out what, what the, what the riches and the values of, of this tradition are. So when I just did my Passover Seder, I invited a handful of non-Jews and, um, they had an incredible experience. Like they really got a lot out of it because the, the, the tradition and the wisdom in it are, are just, they're phenomenal. When you, when you can, when you can present them in that way that links to the universal struggles of humanity and they're all there, but you need to pull them out. And, and, and that's the, that's, that's the challenge which is to, is to be able to pull pull them out and the fun of it, but it's, it's all, it's all in there. Mm. So we have Jewish people as a, you know, distinct ethnic group, though huge variations within that, you know, if you've ever been to Israel, right, you look around and you see yeah. black faces and white faces and Russian faces and everything in between. I mean, it's pretty, di- pretty diverse for one ethnic group. Mm. And, but then there's also this Jewish practice. So you kind of alluded to this earlier, like what would be, the essence of that what would be the purpose of that as, as, as jewish practice there are really two uh parallel lines of development that are taking place there's the right line and the left line there's the line of um light work and there's the line of shadow work and this again can is totally universal can apply to anyone in any religion any spirituality not not uh, just judaism so the, the, the right line, the line of uh, light work, is the line of connecting to the oneness and the, the, um, the unity of all creation. It's, it's about opening to the, uh, to the mystery of existence and how I and you and we are all extensions of that. That our true identity, in, in, in essence, our true identity is that of light. That we are not the people we think we are living the lives we think we're living, but really we are God. That our hands, our bodies are actually God and everything around us is God. That's what it means, God is one. If God is one, does that mean like you're not God and God is somewhere out there? So this I-thou relationship, is gotten, again, kind of mis- misunderstood, misinterpreted. The truth of the right line is that we are all God. And so when it means to be embodied, it means that actually you are God embodied. What does it mean that God works through the world? It means when I embody my consciousness as that of the divine, my hands become an extension of God. So when I do things with my hands and my body, it is God doing things with God's hands and body. That's the, the, the right line. And that's really the traditional kind of transcendent um, you know, practices you find in Eastern traditions mm-hmm. um, of, of, of getting to that place of unity consciousness. And, and a lot of times we see that as like sitting on the, you know, sitting on the, the zafu, sitting on the mat, like meditating. We, we transcend and we get to that place where it's all God, it's all light. But that's just one side. Um, because the other side, we've got the left line. And the left line is, is the line of shadow work. This is really new understanding, I think, um, that's coming out, coming out now, is that the shadow work is essential because that... Um, connects us to where we've come from in this human story. And the right line is where we've come from in the cosmic story. It's like our, our, our cosmic roots in Ein Sof, in, in the place of no end and no beginning. And it's really important to, to dial into that station, to, to get out of our egos and our stories about who we are. But then we need to come back into the, to the left line to say like, Okay, but no, I've got all these patterns. You know, I, I, you know, I watched a video of yours and you know, your whole yoga embodiment is about the patterns that we have and looking at them and finding new patterns and, 
and, and becoming liberated from those patterns. So that's why this other side is so essential is to see like, where did I come from? Who are my parents, my grandparents, my ancestry? And how is that playing out in my life? And I, I just had the Seder again, like I was talking about. And in the Seder, we talk about slavery. And we have our personal slavery. We have our, you know, our pharaohs, our inner pharaohs that are, um, uh, you know, telling us we're not good enough, um, telling us that uh, we should be ashamed about this or that, uh, you know, um, saying we're not strong enough, all these disempowering tapes we have, those are our inner pharaohs. Those are, the, those are the, the things that we are enslaved to that don't allow us to be free. But then we have our collective pharaohs. We have our, our ancestral trauma that is imprinted in our DNA that is moving and impacting and, and moving us without our, without any, without our awareness whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. I always have that when I'm in Israel with food, cause I'm from an Irish background and it's kind of almost like this shared resonance with people of like, Oh, you, you're fucked up around food too, too. You have food trauma. Let's feed each other. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's like a sort of shared cultural resonance from different cultures. So I'm fairly comfortable with theistic terms. You know, my mum was a Catholic nun, and you know, I grew up with them. I'm sort of reclaimed them after kind of getting rid of them for a bit. Yeah. Um, for those who aren't, so let's talk about that first path. So, in kind of Buddhist terms, it might be kind of transcending or um, your everyday self becoming kind of one with everything, or um, you know, Nirvana, Samadhi. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of transcendent path, isn't it? Like, yes. like how would you talk about this to someone that said, you know, I'm a hardline atheist as soon as, cause I know some people listen as soon as they hear the word God, they're turning off. Right. Right. I'm, I'm tempted to ask you the horrible question of what do you mean by God? Sure. No, no, no. I have, I have no problem answering that. <laughs> okay. Go. <laughs> Let's hear it then. Yeah. So, so, so really God to me is the mystery. And if I were to talk to an atheist, I'd say, where are you? And I'd really just get them to really think about that question of where are you? Where are we? What the fuck is this? And when you go deep and you start to like say, well, we're on earth or, well, not even most of you, I'm in Canada you know, you're in England or wherever, you know, like, and then no, go bigger. Okay. I'm on, you know, I'm in this continent. I'm, you know, I'm in this country. I'm in this continent. I'm on the globe. I'm on the earth. Keep going, keep going. I'm in the, you know, the galaxy. I'm in the, what, what is this? Where are we? The, the truth is, no matter how many words you can put to it, you don't know. None of us know where we are. We're in mystery. This whole thing is a mystery. And so everything that's here is made up of the mystery. And that's light. That's like what I would call spiritual light is the capacity to access the mystery, the mystery of not knowing. You know, all of Zen, you know, Zen tradition is about getting to the place of don't know. The place of don't know is the place of mystery. It's like, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by the mystery of this, of this existence, right? So that, that to me is like, is like God. It, it's, it's this awesome mystery that we can not just think about, but we can look at our hands and be like, what, what the fuck am I? Like, what, what is this? And then through that, like we start, everything starts to expand and we can feel and see ourselves and everything around us as light. Or you can see it from a purely scientific standpoint, right? That the world is made of energy. Matter is really energy. Everything in existence is energy. So what is energy? Energy is light. That is light. That is spiritual light. It's spiritual energy um, from its from its core source. And and if you and if so, if you go back further and further, where did all this come from? Where did all this come from? When you go to that source of existence, that that's like the 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 source that is birthed everything and is can makes everything connected. Everything's connected to that source. So we're all, that's oneness. The oneness means that everything is made out of the same substance, the same core substance, which is light. 
Okay, let's relate this to the body because that's our podcast and you know we could be getting sort of very upper chakras here very quickly so how, how does that how does that experiment with the body is it for example you know if i'm deep in meditation i have a really strong sense of the sort of constant flow and flux of the body or there is this deep you know as i go deep into myself there's a real sense of mystery there that i that is it's not just like okay there's my bones and my muscles yeah great that's good too you know you can do that kind of work with embodiment but there's something else. There's a sort of tuning in to a depth of being, of mystery, which is, is quite special. And I, I definitely find the body as a gateway to that. I mean, is this resonating with the kind of thing you, you're talking about or is this something totally different? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's getting that, getting to that place in the body that feels, yeah, this like absolute mystery, awe and wonder. When you, It's really like for me, when I, when I look at my hands and I see them in a completely different way, like, like I relate to them in a completely different way. That's the, the mystery that I see uh, emanating from, from these hands of just like, wow. And then like, the whole body comes online in that mystery. That's really like embodying spirit. That's, that's what that is. It also seems to me like a mystical approach from whatever tradition seems to expand the body. So one way of looking at kind of enlightened type states is like experiencing others as part of your own body, for example. So it would be totally weird to hurt them because why would you punch yourself in the head? That's totally odd. And you know, the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this, like this sense of like, I know when I'm tuned into this mystical state, I'm just yeah, much nicer yeah. and people say I'm more ethical or whatever. Cause why would I, you know, I'm not going to hit myself in the head right now. So why would I hit anyone else? And I'm using that as an extreme example. I'm saying I go around punching people in Brighton, but you know, thinking about it sometimes. And then, <laughs> and then the wider world starts to seem like the body as well. Right. So it's, it's yes. an, ex- yes. an expansion of embodiment into the realms of the sort of intersubjective and what's normally considered the objective. Yes. Yes. So when I, when I, when I, uh, one of the teachings I do is, ex- is, is around expanding our circle of identity. So when we think about when we were born and we think, Oh, I was born 40 years ago in New York and uh, to my mom, blah, blah, blah. And this is, this is when I was born. This is who I am. But I, here's here's one of the you know the, the the gems of our Jewish tradition is that every year, twice a year uh, on on Rosh Hashanah on the Jewish New Year, um, and in and uh, you know in in Passover the time we just had, um, we're invited, especially in Rosh Hashanah, to see like it's the birthday of humanity. It's not just the New Year, but it's the birthday of humanity. So we're invited to see ourselves as as being born, as as tuning into our our more expanded um, birthday, which means w- if I can see in myself that I wasn't just born forty years ago, but that I was born with the birth of the universe, that actually I am whatever it is now. They're calculating five hundred billion years old, like that actually that was when I was born because everything has come from the beginning of time to the edge of time, which we're in right now. And I wasn't just popped down here when I was 40. Like I came from my mom who came from her, you know, dun, 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 and it goes all the way back. So, so if you can imagine if we start to embrace that kind of consciousness, that my birthday was the birth of the, the birth of the, the cosmos, and that actually I'm not 40 years old, I'm 500 billion years old, and so are you, we start to relate to each other on a much, much different level. It's, it's like, yeah, the quality of relation there becomes so different, so mm. much more reverence, so much more connection. You know, in other traditions, there are this sort of seeing the divine in the other, or Hindu couples will call each other sort of little God names as kind of pet names for their husband and wife, for example, mm-hmm. you know, to remind them that this is a manifestation of the divine in, in the yeah. form of the husband or wife. Um, what about this, the, the, the Kin Alam, this kind of heal the world thing that's part of Ju- the Jewish tradition as well? And cause it, some traditions could be seen as just, you know, about yourself. You have to get enlightened or, you know, you do lots of yoga and you work on yourself 
but there's a sort of bigger mission, isn't there, in the in the Jewish way of looking at things? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tikkun olam, and it's interesting. My the 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 path that I'm creating now, and in, in terms of my my perspective on uh, you know sort of integral perspective on Judaism, is called path of tikkun, um, because tikkun is the central. Uh, message and director here. When tikkun means healing or repair. And so tikkun olam, olam is world, so it means the healing or repair of the world. And, and really that is, the, again, the kind of uh, spiritual directive of our religion. It's the purpose of our religion, which is to heal the world. And what does that actually mean? It means that in our tradition, in the Kabbalistic tradition, we see... Um, we see that the world came into being with, with a purpose and that it came from the state of nothingness and through this chain linking down, it came into, a, into to finite reality was created. And that um, in essence, we're meant to, you know, we were in a state of union with the divine and then we came out and we, we lost that connection and lost that identity. We forgot it. And now it's about you know, traveling back up um, the cosmic tree of life to get back to a state of union, but within individuality, which is the kind of paradox that we're, that we're playing with here. But tikkun olam, um, which is interesting because it's been, been kind of co-opted by a kind of more conservative reform Judaism to be like um, social justice, environmental work, which is, yes, it's all part of it. That, that's a huge aspect of it. Um, but it's like really it comes again. I bring it back down to this thing called tikkun hanefesh, repair of the soul, repair of the personal. And nefesh, there are many different la- levels of soul in Judaism, um, but the nefesh is the most is the, is the most personal. Again, it comes back to this place of our own trauma. That's where where I've, I've seen so much so much information now coming down is that. We're here to, to, you know, not just heal the world by being activists environmentally or in social justice to get out there and try and change, the, you know, change governmental policies. Yes, that's part of it. But really the, the biggest tikkun, the biggest kind of healing we can do is when we start to look at our own material. We start to look at our, our shit and how it rules us and is messing with our relationships is screwing us over um in terms of our work in the world uh and 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 start to look at like where did we come from like why do i have these particular habits and patterns of of um of meeting life and meeting stress and meeting relationship um, that's how that's how I've gotten into like relationship counseling because I'm seeing that the 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 essence of our of our material comes out in relationship and it especially comes out in um, romantic relationship and so we have this opportunity not to be like oh god this sucks why does why do I keep doing the same shit different relationships um, why do I keep getting in these fights with my partner. And, and God, I just wish this would end. Rather than that, we have this opportunity to be like, okay, yeah, there's something here. There's work here. There, there's growth potential here. And if I just change my perspective on this material, on these things that seem like they're in the way and start making them the way, I can, I can find richness in, in the muck. And I think that's the, and then that's where I'm coming back to tikkun. Like this is the heart of tikkun. It's finding richness and transformation in the muck of things, and doing the work to do that repair. It's a repair um, in our genes, in our ancestry. Because if we don't do that, and we have kids, we pass that same package of shit onto them. It's like an ancestral inheritance of material of a backpack of material that we pass on to them but whatever we can make tikkun on whatever we can take out of that backpack whatever we can heal we give a lighter load to the next generation yeah the sins of the father aren't passed on huh that's the biblical quote 
So, and is this what you mean by a kind of um, alchemical path as well? The idea of sort of turning lead into gold, turning the relationship problems and the stress with your kids and the marketplace, you know, financial worries or whatever it is, like turning that business practices into the path itself rather than just seeing this sort of kind of annoying problems on the path as yes. opposed to sort of, you know, some myth- mythical faith, I think you've called this as well, like opposed to that. So you say a little bit about that. Is that what you're talking about here or something different? Yes, that's a definite, definite piece of it is turning those things that seem like lead, that seem heavy and annoying and in the way and burdensome into the path themselves, into we turn them into gold, we turn them into transformation. Absolutely. But there's another layer of that, which is it's really, really beautiful, which is that you know there's this sense of a kind of... Um, mythical faith versus an alchemical faith and a mythical faith is kind of like i see you know i see the this practice of kosher you know right everybody knows probably you know anyone who knows jews or you know, you know everyone the kosher has become a pop culture word right oh it's not kosher kosher mate it's fucking well kosher that's that's the london way of saying it oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's like it means like good or like they're taking it from the jewish the Jews in North London and taking it into kind of like popular culture. So oh, it's, it's well kosher, mate. That means it's, it's approved. It's good, right? Like, Awesome. Okay, nice. I never knew that before. So there's this like the, the mythical understanding of kosher is that God said to Moses, which who Moses wrote down in the Bible, wrote down in the Bible that these animals are pure. These animals are impure. Now, you can eat these and you can't eat these. Um, if you eat these, you're good. If you, if, you eat, if, you, if you eat these ones that we say don't eat, you're in trouble. You know, you're going to get a punishment. You're going to hell or whatever it is. Like this old mythical understanding um, of, these, of these laws. But if we look at the, if we try to look at kosher through an alchemical lens, we see what's actually being taught here. What's, what's, what's being brought down? So, so spirit is saying like there's a there's a way to eat that is in alignment with your higher self or there's a way to eat that's in alignment with with a larger code of of morals or um divine awareness and you can you can like the 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 relationship with what we put in our bodies matters it's important so so when i look at that i you know there's in the progressive uh you know there's a there's a you know a segment of the jewish uh tradition now called jewish renewal started by uh, a rabbi rabbi zalman shachter shalomi um who's no longer no longer living but he 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 kind of formulated and created this path called jewish renewal which 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 really embraces um all the different traditions, Buddhism, yoga, Islam, and um, finds the connections and the bridges between them as a, as a path of uh, universal unfolding and universal connection. And so there's a thing called eco-kosher. <laughs> right. Right? So it's like eco-kosher, right? So, so it's taking this like mythical understanding and bringing it to more of an alchemical understanding that that actually the what we put in our bodies has has um, an alchemical experience it has an alchemical transformation and if we put things in our bodies that are toxic then we're eating t- toxins so so this idea that like just because uh, you know kosher essentially what it means is that that um, traditionally now is that there's a rabbi or someone uh, who knows the tradition who goes to uh, the different uh, companies uh, who are cr- making food, um, and he's generally a man. He supervises the the you know what's what's happening to make sure that the you know the, the factory workers aren't eating a, a ham and cheese sandwich when they're packaging flour. And they're getting crumbs and ham and cheese in there, which isn't kosher. Ham is pork is not kosher. So there's there's a there's a there's a 
there's a supervision that's taking place and then that that product gets a kosher symbol so yeah. if you look up you know pick up a can of soda there's a kosher symbol on there but when we look at it through a eco kosher perspective we say is that soda actually kosher if it's poisoning your body yeah if, so this is if, sort of like if, rainforest certified organic you know we have these stamps don't we now that are kind of like you know animal not tested on animals is one you'll have in the uk that you can have on food or makeup or whatever so it's they like, you so there's a sort of you saying that we need like a kosher 2.0 you know like a new kind of kosher stamp you know which says okay environmentally kosher or fair trade kosher yeah. These kind of things, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and imagine if, see, imagine if we, if each religion kind of got on board with that, and we started boycotting all these things that not only you know is the food not healthy, but the the practices of the corporation that's creating them are not healthy. They're you know they're, they're putting their environmental waste into the you know into the planet. They're not um, considering the the impact on the environment in all these different ways. They're not treating their employees fairly all of these things that we would say are kind of in alignment with a higher code, that would be a new kosher symbol. Like that would be a new status of what it means to be eco kosher. So yep. it's like understanding rather than from a mythical lens of like God said so, so you got to do it to this alchemical lens, like understanding, no, there's actually like something that happens when I eat something that, is pure and that has the 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 company who had good practices around environment around its employees and there's actually something different in the quality of digestion of digesting that energy that's in that food if that food is come has a toxic energy in any way then there's there's i'm I'm ingesting toxins yeah and that you know the thing is that this is a very scent this is like getting to you know I want to honor the fact that, you know, it, it, it's a real sensitivity. And, I, and I, I, I imagine that most of us aren't to that level of sensitivity where, we, you know, what we put in our bodies, we, we can connect to the, you know, the energy of that. So, so I, want to, I, I want to honor the fact that it's like, it's a little bit yeah, out there. I think many of us have had the experience of having some sort of really ordinary food cooked with love by someone we care about. And it like having a sense of really nourishing us if you tune into that in the body in a slightly different way. Yeah. I think most people have had that experience, like on the positive yeah. side, or having a kind of shitty, you know, hot dog at an airport because <laughs> it's all you could get. I have this quite often, they're just going, ah, oh, or like rubbish pizza or something, just going, there's no love in this. this. This is probably, this animal was probably tortured. Some forest was probably cut down to make room for that animal. Do you know what I mean? Like there is, I yeah, think most yeah. of us have a, that could be pure projection on my part, but I, my sense is there's something to it that you can tune into a little bit. And we had Charles Eisenstein, uh, almost certainly Jewish, uh, on the show yeah. actually as well, who um, was just hadn't clocked that till now. It's like not another one of my teachers um, who um, was talking about, you know, embodied mindful eating. And yeah. point listeners as well to things like stages of faith by Fowler. And, you know, there's a whole developmental theory of religion where one can reclaim one's religion, whatever that was, whether it was Catholicism or Orthodox Christianity or Islam or whatever from a higher level, from a more developed, more sophisticated framework. And I, yes. I think Judaism is the best at this because you guys argue about shit, change shit, make shit up. <laughs> Like you're constantly developing it. There is no like Judaism done. Even though there's these old schools and there's a book yeah. that's very old, people are still going, yeah, but the numbers of the letters in the book. And, you know, there's this, this very Jewish thing of sort of improving things or developing things, which isn't the same in many of the other religions of the world. It's actually outlawed in some. And I think that is a feature of Judaism, which is quite um, unique. And I think shows the way for many of the other faiths to develop yeah. in a more integral way. Absolutely. And that's the, the first, uh, when I got this download, the first website that I did, uh, my first organization was Evolving Judaism. And that's it. It's all about evolution. And, and even in the core tradition, this is where I always bring this to, is that the, 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 there is an oral tradition. And an oral tradition is the way of interpreting this old book, this old code of laws, to an updated way. 
And that was never meant to be written down. Yeah. But because of this whole ancestral trauma of fear and survival, it was written down. And then what happens when something gets written down? It's codified. It's, but, it, it's stuck. It becomes cemented. And that you, you, you kill the, the aliveness of, yeah. of the evolution, of the growth. And that's what's happened, in, I would say, in a lot of the, the Orthodox culture. God, we could talk more about the word as well. You know, that very strong Jewish tradition of sound and the word being kind of a, a key a key thing, which of course voice is embodied, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I can imagine listeners being curious about is they may have heard this word Kabbalah. Could you say a little bit about what that is, how that fits into all this stuff you're talking about? Sure. So Kabbalah uh, actually means to receive. Um, and it's this, it's this uh, mystical Jewish tradition that was uh, kind of received uh, from, from, a, from, a, from more esoteric place, from a higher transmitted place. And it's the deeper mystical teachings on, of the Jewish tradition, a lot of which I'm, I'm drawing from uh, without, without directly acknowledging it. Uh, and it... It, it's you know like I was I touched on just a little bit that um, Kabbalah actually sets up the framework of what we are as lights and vessels. It's not Jew and non-Jew. It's not Christian, Muslim, whatever. It's we're all light. There's lights and vessels, and we are vessels to receive light, and so there's this whole understanding of how the world was created, which I, which I alluded to a bit, like it came from a place of nothingness of Ein Sof. And there was a, there was a pre-creation process that took place, which is what the tree of life, the sphere out, some people have seen that, but like the 10 spheres, that that is what this, this process describes is this pre-creation what I, what I call involution or what, uh, what Sri Aurobindo talked about as involution is the movement from nothingness to, to from, from infinite reality, from inf infinity to finite reality. Like how did that happen? How do we get from got a sudden headache when you said that <laughs> for some reason, my <laughs> left temporal lobe started hurting. Like, you know what? Can we bring this back to the body as well? So like, what's a Kabbalistic approach to the body? Because I sometimes hear this tree of life described as a map, as a psychological map. Mm -hmm. You know, I almost notice when I talk with many of my Jewish friends or teachers, there's always almost this tendency of, of getting cleverer and cleverer. And it's very interesting to me. And I, I could talk to you for another hour. I'm looking at the clock going, shit, I have to go out for dinner soon. And, but it gets cleverer and cleverer and almost out of the body. And I have this experience with many conversations with teachers, mentors, and friends, American Jews, British Jews, Israeli Jews, Iraqi Jews. And there's that tendency to get out of the body, isn't there, with the cleverness of it and the, um, yeah. Yeah. and it's joyful. And there's that sort of banter, we call it in England, that conversation of backwards and forwards. So bring it back to the body, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was the, the so that's the two, the twofold path that I would really say is, 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 the, is the essence of the path of Tikkun that I teach and the essence of Kabbalah is that there's the path of um, experiencing the body as n not different from um, spirit, from spiritual light, and really feeling ourselves as an extension of this divine energy and seeing the, the birth, the, the age of this body um, as being much much older than we than we usually think, and then there's the there's the 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 left side, which is really getting into like all our patterns and how these bodies and these egos move through the world as an expression of patterns, and how that limits our capacity to to be in the body and to be in the body in the way that it was intended to be in the in this kind of fluid and um, open way like our bodies are locked up and they're locked up because we're in trauma and we don't realize that because we've been past ancestral trauma down and down and down the land that we're living on mostly uh, you know especially in the US and parts of Canada like 
there's trauma in it because there, there are people who, who are native indigenous to that land who have been slaughtered on there. So there's like that trauma is here and it's locking up our bodies the way that we live culturally. And that's what I would say, kind of a disembodied, um, numbed out song of disappointment. That's kind of how I, how I, how I say it. it's like the, the, our culture is just like numbed out and disappointed. That's because we're disconnected from our bodies. We're disconnected from deeper purpose and meaning. We're disconnected from kind of spiritual light. Um, and we need to do these practices to, to unlock our bodies. And we unlock our bodies through, through the meditation and the connecting to the oneness of, of existence, to the mystery of where the hell this all came from and what the hell we are. And then there's that the, we unlock our bodies through meeting the material that, that, that got us all caged up, that's got us all locked down uh, in these patterns that don't serve us, that don't serve our partnerships. And we need to look at them. And, I, and, and my sense is that the Jewish tradition and Kabbalah describes the pathways to do this in a very practical way, you know, from, from our daily rituals to our weekly rituals with Shabbat to our monthly rituals and to our, to our yearly and our, our, the whole calendar. The whole calendar is an agricultural calendar. So it's like about being in touch with the earth. We were farmers. We were in touch with the earth. With our hands in the earth, that's being embodied. You know, mm-hmm. you think about you know what's the most embodied you can be. Um, so that's what it's. Yeah, that that that's what I would say. It's it's getting get, That's the way into the body. It's through the mind, through understanding the the practices. But it's a it's a total practice of embodiment. And, and the cycles thing totally makes sense for me. You know, I grew up in a, a farm village that still had all these pagan hangovers attached to uh, pagan bits attached to the Christianity. So we had a um, a spring festival that was all about fertility and a harvest festival. And, you know, it was, it was, it was very much part of how I grew up. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I like the fact that religions often have like a daily cycle, uh, you know, a weekly cycle, maybe a monthly cycle and then a an annual cycle. Mm-hmm. So they're making sure that different things are done at different times. And I, interestingly, in d- designing the best embodiment programs I can, I've come up with similar things like, okay, you have to have practices every day, in the morning, in the evening, you have to have practices every week. And then in the year, we're doing a couple of big things, you know, and we found that's just the best format to, to work through with people. And it's like, oh yeah, you're reinventing the wheel. Well done, Mark. You know, I kind of realized now <laughs> talking to you, like, oh yeah, you grew up with this. It makes sense. <laughs> and the Muslims definitely have that, you know, they have life cycles daily. So praying yeah. five times a day, they, they're really strong on that. I think, um, give us an example, some examples of some of the other real practices. If someone's going, well, this is interesting. This theory is cool. You know, what might be some of the practices uh, within, within this view? Um, so, so, yeah. So I think, like, again, Shabbat, this weekly unplugging from screens and from, from just um, trying to figure shit out and really coming back to the body, coming back to being simpleness, um, joy of eating. Um, Really, yeah, b- blessings over food. I know it seems like what you know, back to grace. But really, like when we pause before we eat, we give ourselves the the the, the opportunity to connect to what we're actually doing instead of being on fucking autopilot. Like our our lives are so much on autopilot that we're not being in our bodies. So actually, saying a blessing or taking a moment to pause before we eat is actually a very, very powerful embodiment practice. Mm-hmm. It gets us in tune with our bodies to what we're actually doing rather than watching something on our phones while we're stuffing shit in our mouths. It's, 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 it helps us to be in our bodies and connect to what we're actually doing and get more pleasure out of it, not just like a physical pleasure, but a, um, a, 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 another pleasure. Um, the, the, yeah, so Shabbat and blessings, there's a, practice we say a blessing after we use the bathroom after we go to the washroom so we're actually connecting to the fact that our bodies work and what a fucking miracle it is that we can get rid of waste that we that our bodies get rid of waste and that we don't have those toxins stuck in us that we have openings that work and we food comes in and waste goes out so it's like oh yeah my body is a miracle 
Like, so right. if we can like, yeah. pause after we go to the bathroom and just be like, wow, my body is a miracle. It yeah. works. Like, can I have some fucking gratitude? How much, I think gratitude is such a, such a, a, a thing that is hard. Like we, we, we have, we have a hard time culturally. Maybe I'm projecting too, but we have a, I, I feel like we have a hard time culturally being grateful for the simple things. We're told we need this thing and this thing and this bigger thing and this yeah. bigger thing to, to be great, grateful. But what if we just come back again to like grateful that my body can pee and shit? Yes. Yeah. Gratitude is, <laughs> I think it's the missing emotion of consumerism because there's never enough. Right. And it's yeah. interesting. I think it's also the miss, missing emotion of the sort of modern um, kind of liberal left actually as well. I don't see a gratitude for uh, one's own civilization or the things we have as a result yeah. until, you know, everything's wrong and broken and raw, angry, angry. Um, yeah, if you want to be, if you if you're not gratitude for going to the toilet, well, have a few days where you can't go to the toilet. <laughs> or, or you know, it doesn't take long. You just just be on, somewhere on a plane when all the toilets are broken. You know, you know, I was on a train and it's like I, I need to pee and I can't pee anywhere here. You know, like the gratitude I had when I got to the other station and two hours later was able to take a leak it was just it was like a huge relief. And I think we could all connect to that, but we forget to, right? I think we, particularly when life's easy. We forget to be great. Yes, that's yes, the irony, yes. right? When life's hard, gratitude. It's like, oh, thank God, I got to eat today. I didn't eat yes. yesterday. Yes. Gratitude is less easy when life is easy. That's an interesting. Yes. And, and that's what we've created. We've created a culture that longs for easiness, that longs for comfort, mm. which then makes it much harder to be grateful and to be present. And makes it much easier just to be numbed out. Like our culture, that's the thing. We're like swimming in a culture of numbness. Like it's created that. And it's actually through through the challenge, again, through the like the challenge of our material, the lead, the heaviness, the blockages, that we are like, oh God, would this just go away? And like that's a symptom of our culture. But if we start, like I said, looking at that as an opportunity for transformation, it changes everything. It becomes like, oh yes, this is this pattern I have with my girlfriend or my wife, like, or my boyfriend, my you know, husband, like, this is like, this is the goal. There's gold here to be, to be alchemized. So, and that too, the, the whole pooping thing, it's like, that also is a metaphor for moving emotion, which is a big, big issue in our culture. It's like, we need to move emotion like we, like we need to poo. There's this, there's a, I have a friend in, uh, in California, Rachel Kaplan, who created the Healing Feeling Shit Show. <laughs> and it's all about getting back to the reality that like moving emotion is like pooing. And if we don't do it, we're full of toxins and we're all fucked up. So we need to move emotions um, just like we need to move the toxins out of our bodies. Okay. So that brings it back again to another layer of embodiment, which is you know emotional embodiment and how like, in our culture when it's not okay to cry or be angry or be sad we're, we're, we're not healthy we're not healed there's no tikkun there so there's a tikkun there's a healing that happens when we're able to express emotion we're able to move that energy through us and like i'm sure i don't know i think there's a there's an english thing that like yeah you know, english people don't they're very proper right right prim and proper like we don't express emotion, like emotion is a taboo, right? We don't want to say what we're really yes. thinking, right? Yeah, that's, I'd say we're a more emotionally repressed culture than Southern Europe, for example, yeah. So there too, it's like that, that's like an ancestral lineage that's being passed down that uh, it, it, it locks up the body, it mm. absolutely locks up the body, so. Okay, well, this has been great. It's been a yeah. very satisfying um wisdom dump to keep with the analogy and um <laughs> i think it's time to wash our hands and, and and go about our business but before we do a couple of things um first up where can uh, people find out more about you do you have a website or where would you point people to yes so uh i do spiritual counseling um via video call um and you can go uh, it's a it's a non-denominational so it's not just judaism i most of my clients are not jewish um, I do that on GavrielStrauss.com. That's G-A-V as in Victor, R-I-E-L-S-T-R-A-U-S-S.com. Um, and uh, that's where I do 
my spiritual counseling, my relationship coaching, and uh, then Evolving Judaism is my other uh, website, uh, evolvingjudaism.org, .com, and then I'm you know, coming out soon with uh, Path of Tikkun. Dot com, which will be you know, more expression of the, the universal wisdom of the Jewish tradition, making it more accessible. Great. And a parting message about the body before we say goodbye. Um, your body is a, is a temple. It's a, a beautiful mystery of existence. And um, yeah, I, I just want to wish everyone the, 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 the journey of, uh, finding the beauty in this this incredible mystery and coming to a place of love and connection um, with the body in the most deep and profound way so that uh, not only bringing healing to ourselves and our immediate relationships but really bringing healing to the to the greater world around us mm, Tadaraba, thank you very much for joining us today yeah thank you mark thanks listeners some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites, there's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on EmbodiedFacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Till next time, welcome home to the body.